Good morning and welcome to worship. We invite you to rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter, and our joy. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Hallelujah. Immersed into the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your voice thundered over the deep and water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant rivers, and the ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land. In a desert pool, the Ethiopian official entered your boundless baptismal life. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Hallelujah. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you opened the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you through the risen Christ, our source of living water in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. Good Christian friends, rejoice.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, with joy, we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of your resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The first reading is from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was given upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Gail will lead us in Psalm 133. <laughs> second reading is from 1st John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal that was with the Father and was related, revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord.
Gospel according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord. I invite you to be seated. I invite the little ones to come forward. If there are some, there's a few in the back. But I think I'm gonna do stories, not just for little ones, but for big ones as well, because it speaks to all of us. Good morning. You wanna sit down or you wanna stand up? Stand up? Okay, that's good. text that I just read, we hear about the disciples gathered together and they're scared and they're frightened and they're afraid. Have you ever been scared, frightened, or afraid? One? or oh, two? Let's ask everybody. Have you been frightened, scared, afraid, fearful? And what do you do when you're afraid? What do you, how do you respond? What do you do when you're frightened? I go into my bed and pull the covers over my head. <laughs> or we hide? Or what do you do when you're frightened and afraid? Run. run. Run, run hard, run fast, get the heck out of there. Any other ways of responding to fear? Pray. Pray? Mm, good one. Anyone else? Pray. Gonna have to talk a little louder, sorry. Scream. Scream. <laughs> I like it. I like it. When I was a little bit older than you, my parents, I lived in Calgary. We went to a place called Heritage Park. I bet you none of you have been to Heritage Park. Have any of you been to Heritage Park? Oh, what a great place, eh? Cool. It's this big piece of land and it's like an old fashioned town. There's horses and buggies and steamboats and trains and old fashioned candy. Ooh, I like the candy part. We went there as a family to experience what it was like. We have nine people in my family growing up, seven kids and two parents, and we brought two extra people from Winnipeg. And we went to Heritage Park and we had a great time. I had never been there before. I was so excited. I was running around looking at everything. We had a great time until about three o'clock. We were going to go home at five o'clock. At three o'clock, I kind of wandered off a little bit. More than a little bit, I got lost.
But I didn't know that I was lost. I, I ran and I exactly ran and ran and ran, looking for my parents, looking for my family. How could they be so silly? How could they get lost? They should know better. Some of them were adults. And it took probably an hour for me to figure out they weren't lost, I was lost. And I was scared, really scared and frightened. And not only did I run, I started to cry. I cried, I cried, cried. I stood in the middle of the street and I cried. And then finally my dad came around the corner and he saw me and he said, Peter. And it felt so good to have my name announced by my dad, Peter. And he ran over and he hugged me and he kissed me and he said, so glad we found you, let's go home. I never felt so good in that car with my seven brothers and sisters. In the text, the disciples are scared, they're frightened, they're shaken in their boots. They're really worried, they're anxious. And Jesus appears to them and says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And the anxieties and the fear go away and they're embraced. And in essence, Jesus kisses them and says, here's your name, you are precious to me. Now go out and tell other people that it's okay, that I have risen from the dead. I read this thing in a book about sometimes when we're afraid, we're kind of tied into knots. I tried this for a whole day yesterday, folks, to get this right. Tied into knots. You know when you feel scared, afraid, you get knots in your tummy? Have you ever had that? I've got a big tongue, so there's lots of knots in there. <laughs> and I tried this yesterday, and I tied knots, and it's like the disciples, they have knots in their tummy. But then Jesus comes and appears, and he, he shows them his hands and his side, and he says, peace be with you. And the knots just like this. And they disappear. And there's new life. And there's joy and there's resurrection. Let's pray. Gracious God, come to us in our fears, in our anxieties, in our doubts. Come and touch us. Come and reveal yourself to us, not only as the crucified one, but also as the resurrected one. That you come to embrace us, to hold us, to kiss us, to name us, and to say we belong to you that we might live in that acceptance, that we might live in that joy and in the good news of Easter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can go back to your parents too. Thank you. <coughs> you can go on. Go back to your parents. <laughs> or you can stay here if you want. This took a whole week, a whole day yesterday to figure out how to do this. And in fact, I tried it this morning, I couldn't get it done, so Mary did it for me, my wife, so. <laughs> it does work, she'll show you later how to make it work. <laughs> we sing Alleluia, sing to Jesus.
marvelous music you have. This is delightful. It's a treat for me. My sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's an amazing text. This text that tells the story of the disciples gathered together on this Easter Eve. They are gathered in seclusion, gathered behind closed doors, scared, frightened, despondent, breathless, going through a kind of a kind of postpartum depression. Jesus has been crucified. Crucified, died, and buried. And even though there was some talk about Jesus' resurrection that morning from Mary and from Peter and the beloved disciple, there is still fear and anxiety and this deep sense of hopelessness and despair. And so they gather together in seclusion and they're not sure of what to say or what to do. In a very real sense, it is as if they are entombed, that they are entombed as well. They are lifeless, breathless, spiritless. They are flat and confused and lost and rudderless. Paralyzed by grief, by fear, by anxiety. And so here they are, locked up. Locked up, locked in, locked down. In a very real sense, we can somehow resonate with those kinds of feelings over the last number of years with this corona stuff. We too have been disheartened and frightened and scared and paralyzed. We too, we too know what it means to be locked in and locked up and locked down. And it isn't to this dismal abyss that Jesus comes. Jesus the crucified one, but now Jesus the resurrected one. Jesus comes. And locked doors, closed doors, cannot dissuade him. And the first words out of his lips are, Peace be with you. And how desperately the disciples, how desperately we need to hear those words, Peace be with you. And he shows them his hands and his side, shows them the wounds and the scars, the scars and the wounds, that have a story to tell. You ever gone to the hospital to visit a family member or friend and they've had surgery or they've had stitches and what's one of the first things they want to do? Show you. <laughs> Lauren Costa, ever happened to you in the hospital or Peter when you went to visit members? They want to show you their scars and their wounds and I was always a little squeamish about that. Uh, I'm not too sure. But over time I came to the realization that those scars and those wounds had a story to tell. And it was important for those people to share that. My youngest brother, Mark, in his 20s, used to build cardboard boxes. That was his job. He worked in a large factory and there was this, this big heavy press that came down and it would press the cardboard and it would twist it and form it into boxes. It was quite a production, but one day Mark got his hand caught underneath that press and it severed the top of his hand, requiring all kinds of stitches, and there was blood all over the place. We don't need to talk about that. But he had this huge scar on his right hand, and it was permanent. And because he lost the use of his right hand for the most part, he would squeeze tennis balls. So when you met my brother Mark, Mark always had a tennis ball, and he'd be squeezing it to try to get back the strength to try to deal with what had taken place. Well, three years after that, Mark died in a plane accident at Great Slave Lake. Tragic accident. But we had the funeral, and the funeral directors put Mark in a casket, and they laid him in the casket, and they put his right hand on his chest and the left hand over the right hand. They, they covered the wounds and the scars. And as I said, I come from a large family. We came to pay our respects, to have some prayers, to spend some time together. And it just didn't feel quite right. And we said, what's going on here? And it took us about an hour to say, that's not quite the mark we knew. So we switched hands. We took the right hand and put that on the top so that the scars were evident and prominent. 
because those scars and those wounds had a story to tell about who Mark was and what he had endured over his lifetime. That was a part of who Mark was in terms of his life. And so we put that on top so people could see it. Wounds and scars have stories to tell. In our gospel lesson, in a much more profound way, Jesus shows the disciples his wounds. His hands and his side showed them the scars and wounds of his body, of his life, of his ministry. Scars and wounds that spoke of his deep, deep, profound love for us and for all of humanity. As we read in Isaiah 53, that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that had made us whole. And with his stripes, with his wounds, we were healed. Scars and wounds that have a story to tell. And then Jesus says for a second time, peace be with you. And not a short, temporary, fleeting peace, not simply the absence of war or the calm between the storms, no, rather a deep, deep abiding peace. A peace that passes all human understanding. A peace that can only come through the death and resurrection of our Lord. And then what does he do? He breathes on them. He breathes on them. He breathes into them. Breathes into them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ruach. The wind, the spirit, the breath of God. Just as God breathed into Adam and Eve in the garden. Just as God breathed into those dry bones that Ezekiel found himself in the midst of. So Jesus breathes new life new life and meaning and purpose into his disciples in that little room. In John's telling of the story, this is not simply an Easter story. It's also a Pentecost story. You'll hear this text in a couple of weeks again. Same text. It's a Pentecost story. Here in the upper room with scared, frightened, broken followers Jesus breathes the Spirit into his disciples. And he sends them out filled with the Holy Spirit, enabled by the Spirit with the mandate, with the promise, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, and if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Craig Barn, a theologian, writes, at the center of the gospel is the proclamation that Jesus Christ comes looking for us. Jesus Christ is active not passive, but actively looking for us. And according to John's text, he walks right through the locked doors, the closed doors to find us, and he shows the wounds, the wounds that come from the cross. Those wounds are markers of forgiveness. And then for a second time, peace be with you. You are forgiven. Profound, profound words, words that we often do not hear in this day and age. You are forgiven, and peace can be restored to your troubled and tortured life. You are set free. The Greek word for forgiveness is translated as to free, as to free or to let go. So in essence, this Easter story is also a freedom story. After finding the disciples, after forgiving them, after restoring peace to their souls, he gives them the Holy Spirit, but he gives them a new identity. He gives them a new ministry, the ministry of grace, of reaching out and proclaiming and, and sharing forgiveness and love and compassion with the rest of the world. Here Jesus is entrusting the disciples and ourselves to a ministry of forgiveness. There are so many things we can do for ourselves in the spiritual life, Craig says. He says, read your Bible, pray, even worship on your own. But when it comes to hearing that we are forgiven, we can't do that on our own. We need a priest. The priest's calling is to declare the absolution of sins. Bishop Marlon Odlin used to share that in his proclamations all the time. You need a priest. You need someone outside of yourself to say to you, you are forgiven, you are set free. The etch-a-sketch has been wiped clear. 
all that stuff that was there before can be erased. We can do lots of things on our own, but we need a priest to proclaim a good word, to proclaim the gospel, the good news that Christ is in our midst, in our joys, in our celebrations, but also in our brokenness, in our pain, in our suffering, a word that is spoken from outside of ourselves, a word of hope, a word of promise, a word of liberation. As Craig writes once again, if we do not forgive those who hurt us, there's only one other alternative. If we don't forgive, then we retain the sins. And to retain means to hold on to. To hold on to the hurts and the pains, to lock ourselves into the identity of being a victim. And as Lewis Smedes writes, when you forgive, you set a prisoner free. And when you discover that the prisoner prisoner is you yourself. So in essence, he writes, the choice is ours. You have one choice. You want to be a priest or do you want to be a victim? To be a victim is to hold on to the hurts and to the pains. To be a priest is to free, to free ourselves and to free others. Boy, well, that sounds good in theory, doesn't it? But we all know that forgiveness is not easy. It's hard work to forgive, to let go. And yet we do not do that on our own. That's the nature of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives to the church. The spirit that calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies. The spirit that empowers. The spirit that enables us to be disciples and to be followers of Jesus. As Craig writes, we are disciples. We are not called to produce forgiveness. We are called to be priests that pronounce the forgiveness that comes to us through the cross. That's why the cross is central in our church. That's why we always begin worship every Sunday with the confession of sins, to say, we come before you, God, and we've messed up again. <laughs> we've screwed it up, sorry. And until we get that right, it's hard to continue on with worship, to praise and to give thanks until we say, here's who we are. And we know that God speaks a word of grace and forgiveness and absolution in the waters of baptism. You are forgiven, you are set free, you are liberated. You see, that's what we're called to be as the church, to be people who open doors. I served at Mount Olive in South Surrey for 32 years. And about six Christmas, no Christmas, six Easter's ago, um, one of our members came to church and it was a full house and that was great. And uh, Mount Olive was kind of strange because the front doors face one street and the back doors face the parking lot, but everyone comes in through the parking lot. So that morning we got up early, we had Easter breakfast, but everyone opened the back doors, but not the front doors. And so here comes this member and the church was full. So he had to walk three or four blocks to church and he got there and we were singing and playing music and he went to the front door and the door is locked. <laughs> Great witness to the community. Here's Mount Olive. Praise the Lord, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Sorry, you can't get in, there's no room for you. Thank God he came around to the back and came in. Our job is to proclaim, to evangelize, to share the good news that Christ comes to open doors, to unbind the gates, to knock down the walls, the walls that divide and alienate us, the walls that wound us. Jesus comes to forgive. Jesus comes to say, you are loved, you are forgiven, you are set free, you belong to me. We need to hear that, whether we're that size or this size. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are named, child of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ. Good news. Jesus Christ is risen today and tomorrow and the next day. Hallelujah.
Alleluia. Alleluia. We stand and we sing the hymn of the day. Continue with the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Your church cries out, O God, and you listen. As you drew near to the disciples, draw near to us this day. Breathe on us your Holy Spirit, that our faith is renewed and we witness to your love. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your creation cries out, O God, and you listen. Nurture trees, crops, wildflowers, and all growing things. Guide farmers, gardeners, avarists, and others who tend the soil and nurture plants into life. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your world cries out, O God, and you listen. Guide police, firefighters, paramedics, and other first responders to work for the well-being of communities and the dignity of every person, that no one may need to live in fear. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your children cry out, O oh God, and you listen. Hear your people crying out for justice, for an end to racism and other oppression and for a world where all are fed and safe. We pray for all who cry out in suffering or in pain. We pray for Nathan and Caden, young men both suffering from mental illness. God of grace. Hear our prayer. We pray for Cheryl, 
Nick, Sandy, and all who are dealing with cancer. God of grace. Hear our prayer. We pray for our own Pastor Kristen. Guard her, dear Holy Triune God, and watch over her. God of grace. Hear our prayer. We pray for our people in Emmaus Place. Watch over them, please. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your congregation cry out, O God, and you listen. <coughs> Renew pastors, deacons, musicians, and other staff, administrators, and volunteers who facilitated Holy Week and Easter worship. Open our hearts to discern where God calls each of us to serve. God of grace. Hear our prayer. We pray for those having baptismal anniversaries. We pray for Amory, Emily, Tanner, Olivia, Jackie, Adrian, Allison, Amanda, Derek, Leanne, Jim, Leanne, Leanna, Jeff, Ryan, and Melissa. God of grace, hear our prayer. Accept our gratitude, O God, for the lives of those who now rest in you. Grant us your peace, and amid our fears, God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love. Through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord, Peace of Christ be with you always. And I'm not sure how you do that in this congregation, but do it the way you usually do it. <laughs> Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is our duty and our joy to give you thanks and praise, Lord God of heaven and earth, because you are continually renewing your work of creation and transforming it to show your glory through resurrection. With your touch, you formed us from the dust of the earth. You raised your people from slavery and Egypt. 
You bound them to you through your covenant in Sinai, and you made yourself known to them in exile and the promised land. In the cross of Jesus, you take into yourself the scars of our sin, and in his resurrected body, you invite us to touch the wounds of your love. And so we gladly thank you with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven singing the hymn of your unending praise. God. Your son's disciples cowered behind closed doors, and yet in him you visited them on the evening of resurrection, and breathed on them the spirit of peace. Breathe that Holy Spirit upon us now, that your church may know the power of your forgiveness. And these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ, who at supper with his disciples took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, he gave you thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this as he took the cup. Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord and God, intimate Savior of our lives and cosmic ruler of the universe, in Jesus you are the substance of things hoped for and the knowledge of things unseen. Visit any who struggle under the shadow of doubt, minister among all who suffer beneath the claims of oppressive rule. Resurrect your children, your church, and your earth. Bless those who have not seen and yet believe. And shape your wounded body of the church to let the world see you through its scars. Lift every voice to sing your Easter glory until the day when all stand before your throne in eternal communion with one another and with you. Every one, ever one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. We sing together, Lamb of God.
Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and our friend. Amen. Amen. I invite you to rise. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and forever. Amen. Be seated, pronounce it, stand, pronounce it. Yeah. Be seated. Could be long, could be short. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Just a few announcements uh, for this coming week and a bit beyond. Uh, Monday, the quilters are in the hall. Tuesday, the artists. And Tuesday evening, council meeting in the hall at 7.30. Uh, regular choir practice Wednesday. Friday, there's the TW Concert Band and Orchestra concert here at 7.30. A reminder that uh, sign-up sheets, flowers, are still needed for April 14th and 28th coffee hosts, greeters, and ushers for the month of May. The sign-up sheets are already up there. Um, 50th Anniversary Planning Committee, the next meeting will be Tuesday, April 16th at 5 p.m. in the hall. Following that, at 7 p.m. Uh, is the annual general meeting for the Langley um, Housing Society, Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran Church, Langley Housing Society. And a reminder, the little free pantry, if you can continue to bring some non-perishable items that will get stocked uh, regularly, you can bring them to church. And uh, blessings of the quilts will happen Sunday, April the 21st. Uh, there's also a notice of a memorial service in the community. Uh, is from the family of Yvonne Holmgren and Ivan. Yvonne was a member of this church in the past. She passed away in December, and her memorial service is May 5th at 3 p.m. at Mount Olive Lutheran Church in South Surrey. Um, those are your announcements. And I believe there's coffee. Is there coffee today in the hall? Nobody knows? Make your way over if you don't smell any. You can still visit. One more announcement. Um, this time of year, the stewardship uh, service response forms. Um, I'll be standing out at the back and handing them out. It's really appreciated if you fill them out. A lot of the divisions and need hands or whatever to help in anything. So at the back of the form, uh, there's options. If you have something else that you're good at or whatever that you're getting, please fill it out. And uh, at the back, I see it and there's a white little basket to put it in there. If you need an extra one for other members in your family, please let me know. Um, I'll give you an extra one and we'll leave some at the uh, at the back there as well. Um, if you aren't able to volunteer, there's a little space to just say I'm able to. Uh, we just appreciate that. That way, at least you know when everybody's had the opportunity to at least fill up one more and you know, participate in the community of the volunteer. Thank you, and I just got the thumbs up. There is coffee after the service today. Thank you.